I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemy. You know the Lord gave him and blessed be the rock. Let God my salvation be a song. You know the Lord gave him and blessed be the rock. Let God my salvation be exalted. Jesus Christ died for me. And he took away my sin. I will live with him for eternity. You know the Lord live in and bless me the rock. Let God of my salvation be exalted. You know the Lord live in and bless me the rock. Let God of my salvation be exalted. You know. Good morning. Good morning. All right, let's praise God this morning. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing. Standing on the promises I cannot fail oh, When I'm shorn of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises Will you bow with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for allowing us to wake up this morning to experience your creation again, to gather together here with brothers and sisters to worship you. We pray that our time spent here is bringing honor and glory and praise to you. Lord, at this time we're uh, asking you to bless those who are unable to be here, whether it be for sickness or for travel. We pray for those that are traveling. We pray that you'll keep them safe, help them reach their destination safely. And for those that are ill, Lord, we pray that you will be with those caring for them and help them to regain their health and regain their strength so that they can uh, join us here again. Lord, we're thankful for the many visitors we've had here this, this weekend and for those that have come to worship with us this morning. We thank you for blessing us with their presence. And we pray that uh, the time that they've spent here visiting will be a blessing to all those that they're around. We pray that as they depart to return to their homes, we pray that you will grant them safe travel. But we pray for all those who work here at the church, for our elders, our deacons, ministers, classroom teachers, 
and those who take care of the facilities around here, Lord, we pray that uh, all that we do, we keep you as the main focus and that we're able to do what we can and what you uh, need us to do to reach out into this community and bring those who don't know you into, the, into your fold. Lord, again, we, we thank you for all the blessings you've given us, and we thank you for the sacrifice of your Son. And in Jesus' name, amen. There's a message true and glad for the sinful and the sad. Ring it out, ring it out. It will give them courage to, it will help them to be true. To ring it out, ring it out, ring out the word. Glory and honor and domain. 
If you ask anybody who knows me well, they would tell you that they know that I'm not much of a gardener, lawn type of person. But my dad was. My dad absolutely loved to work. And, and if you look at, at mom's yard, it still has so many traces of my dad. Every time though I do get out and actually pull some weeds and, and help carry with some things because she's she's much better at that than I am I can't help but think of my father it's like there's a connection in that even though it, it's not my thing there's sometimes when I get up early in the morning first thing I want to do is have a cup of coffee and when I do I can't help but make a connection with my brother my oldest brother and even though he's been gone for six months, there are so many times when I take that first cup of coffee in the morning and I think of sharing it with him because that was our thing. Before he would leave for Little Rock, work in Little Rock, we would often have a cup of coffee together before I would go to the gym and he would leave. It brings me to a remembrance in a way that a lot of things could not. It's neat because that word remembrance, if, when you read in 1 Corinthians 11, a passage that we often go to for the Lord's Supper, the word remembrance, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. And that word is really divided. It, it comes from two words. One of them actually means to go through a process. And the other one means to bring to mind. So it's not just that you sit here and try to do something with your mind. You're physically involved in a way that's very special as well. What we're about to do is supposed to take us to a place like nothing else can, where we can truly remember the connection we have with our Savior through his sacrifice. We can truly remember what he's done for us. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we break the bread, as we drink the cup, as we physically go through motions, may this process take us to a very special place in a very special way. May it help us to truly remember 
what has been done for us. May we make the connection. Father, may it not just be emotion for us. May it be something truly incredible. As we partake of the bread, we do pray that we do it in a way that is pleasing to you, where we recognize that body that was sacrificed. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, you told your disciples, whoever eats my body and drinks my blood has life in them. And it was such a confusing thing to so many that day. May it not be for us. May this time truly be just as if we are partaking in your son's body and your son's blood that he shed for us. And Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, we, we thank you for that shed blood. It's hard to understand your love for us and what it accomplished for us, but we are so grateful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's give thanks for the offering. Father, you have truly given us so much, uh, more than we can imagine, uh, more than we can express, more than we uh, have gratitude for, unfortunately. And Father, I'm so thankful to be a part of a congregation that is so giving that there never seems to be a time when uh, we worry about meeting budget. But much more than that, there never seems to be a time when we worry about those in need having enough. It is a blessing to see such examples of giving all around us. But Father, we also pray that you will have us to never be satisfied with where we are. That whether it is of our lives or of our means, that we will strain ourselves to give more in your service because you gave all for us. And Father, we're so, so thankful. Help us to be more thankful. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at his name. There is no other name. No name by which we're saved. There is no the name but Jesus at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow at the name of Jesus every tongue confess at the name of Jesus every knee will bow every knee shall bow at his name every knee shall bow at his name every knee shall bow at his name let us all together stand at this time, we'd like to dismiss to Wiggler's Worship, as well as the nursery. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, bruised and broken by the fall. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pardoning. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. Come ye Love proclaim, hallelujah. 
church say it. You may be seated. I normally don't preach with my computer up here, but my iPad just died. So I'm wondering if we could take up a special collection for the preacher's iPad. I hope it won't be too distracting to either one of us. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. He will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony. Seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. And when they say to you, inquire, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? To the teaching and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick Darkness. This is the word of the Lord. I want to know where you get your news nowadays. With all the talk about fake news, it's hard to know the sources you can trust. They all seem to be so radically different, not just in their opinions, but in their version of the facts, too. Where do you get your news? And how do you make decisions? I mean, surely you don't just wade out into the great unknown, uninformed, do you? Some of you are going to go vote in the next couple of weeks, and how are you going to decide which politicians or issues you should support or refrain from supporting? And then what about spiritual matters? Where do you get your information about spiritual things? How do you determine a spiritual direction? Can you ever really know what the will of God is? Just this week, Christianity Today published a survey. It was a story about how Christian people determine what they believe. And the headline says it all. Christian, what do you believe? Survey says, probably a heresy about Jesus. The report actually indicates that Christians, and I use that term very loosely, espouse all sorts of things not supported by the Scriptures. And the headline heresy is that 78% of those surveyed do not believe that Jesus is God. They believe that He is the first and greatest being created by God. Not God. But there are some other numbers that are noteworthy. 52% of those people surveyed believe that most people are basically good. 51% believe that God accepts the worship of all religions. And listen to this one. 
On social issues, the 2018 edition is the first of this particular survey to find that more Americans agree than disagree that the Bible's condemnation of homosexual behavior does not apply today. 44% to 41%, and if you're a millennial, it's, uh, it's 51%. And speaking of the millennials, 46% of millennials believe that gender identity is a choice. Now listen, this isn't a survey of pagans. This is a survey of, of Christians. These are people who identify as God's people. And I'm wondering, where are they getting their information? Well, there are two other... There are two other pieces of information in this survey that might explain it. The survey says that more than half of millennials, 53%, believe that the Bible contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally true. And 60% of all respondents agree that religious belief is a matter of personal opinion and not objective truth. How can so many people who claim to be God's people be so confused about who God is and what God expects? And I guess it all depends on where they get their information. I want you to listen very carefully to me. If God's people don't rely on God's Word to know God's will. They are doomed to make decisions and to go off in directions that are completely at odds with God. You just ask old Ahaz. Ahaz feared the advance of his enemies, Syria and Israel. And so God sent the prophet Isaiah to encourage him to trust God's promises. Just trust God. Isaiah said to Ahaz, if you are not firm in your faith, you won't be firm at all. But Ahaz, even though he was God's king, was not in the habit of listening to God's word. I don't know what he was listening to, but it wasn't God. And so Ahaz went off in a different direction. He called for the Assyrians to come and protect him from his enemies. How stupid! The Assyrians were the enemy of them all and they were marching away anyway. And so God sent his prophet Isaiah back to Ahaz. This time with a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us, God with you, Ahaz. Believe God, trust God, obey God. How much clearer could God have made it to Ahaz? Or as the old song says, What more can he say than to you he has said? God revealed his will to Ahaz in both speech and sign in both word and wonder, Ahaz was totally without excuse. But I guess, I guess that Ahaz must have thought that Isaiah's words were only helpful accounts of ancient myths and not literally true. I guess Ahaz must have thought that Isaiah's sermons were just his personal opinions and not objective truth. I don't know. I don't know what he was thinking, but I know this. He did not rely on God's Word to determine God's will, and he went off in directions that were completely at odds with God. And it cost him and his people dearly. He rejected God with us, and he got Assyria with us. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. 
In that day the Lord will whistle for the fly that is at the end of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they will come and settle in the steep ravines and in the clefts of the rocks and on all the thorn bushes and in all the pastures. And in that day the Lord will shave with the razor that has been hired beyond the river, with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it will sweep away the beard also. And the Lord spoke to me again, because this people has refused the waters of Shiloh that flow gently, and rejoice over Rezin and the son of Remaliah, therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river mighty and many the king of Assyria and all his glory. And it will rise over all its channels and go over all its banks and sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck, and its outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. Ahaz rejected God. He rejected God's word through God's promise, or through God's prophet about God's promise. He courted Assyria and he got Assyria. There's an old saying about the two greatest tragedies in life. One is not getting what you want and the other is what? Getting it. Ahaz wanted Assyria and he got Assyria. In the 730s BC, Assyria conquered the Syrians. In the 720s B.C., they conquered Israel, but they didn't stop there. They marched all the way down through Judah, destroying 46 walled cities, exiling more than 200,000 people in the process. They marched right up to the gates of Jerusalem and besieged it for three years. And the word of the Lord came to pass just like Isaiah promised. It's not the word that Ahaz would have preferred, but it's the word of God that he picked. You see, it occurs to me that, that God with us is not just comforting. It's confronting. The promise of God brings comfort to those who believe the promise, to those who trust the promise, to those who obey the promise. But the promise of God's presence also confronts those who reject it with the consequences of disobedience. God was going to be with Ahaz one way or the other. And the way he preferred was not the way he picked. Ahaz was afraid. I, I get that. Oftentimes when we're in stressful or threatening situations, we kind of lose our minds. But God told him, be careful, be quiet, don't fear, don't let your heart be faint. Isaiah says, Ahaz, you should have feared the Lord more than you feared your situation. You should have respected your king more than you respected your enemies. God's word of God with us could have been a sanctuary for old Ahaz. Could have been a refuge in the time of trouble, but instead it was his ruin. And it caused him to stumble. And the sad reality was that because Ahaz stopped listening to the Lord, the Lord stopped talking to Ahaz. In our text for this morning, God told Isaiah to focus his preaching on those who would listen. To interpret his signs to those who were actually interested. And the Lord explained to Isaiah that as the Assyrians marched through the land, as they got closer and closer to Jerusalem, people were going to want to know what to expect. They were going to want to know what was going to happen. They were going to be desperate for information. They were going to be willing to look for information in, in any source conceivable, even, even a demonic source. And God said, Isaiah, when that happens, when the people come back to you and they want to know what's going to happen, you say to them, should not a people inquire of their God? Go to the teaching. Go to the testimony." I mean, there was really no question about what was going to happen. Ahaz and his people knew exactly what to expect because God had revealed it to them in no uncertain terms, but they refused to listen. 
They had the light of dawn. They preferred the darkness of midnight. Listen, if God's people will not rely on God's word to determine God's will, then they are doomed to make decisions and pursue directions that are exactly opposite of God. They are doomed to exchange God for Assyria. God with us will become Assyria with us. The sanctuary will become a stumbling stone. And I'm just wanting to know this morning, who, who are you listening to? Where do you get your information? How do you make decisions? about anything, but especially about spiritual matters. Do you listen to the politicians, the pundits, the philosophers, the professors, or do you listen to the word of the Lord? Do you retreat to the teaching and to the testimony? That's my question. When Ahaz left behind the word of the Lord, Ahaz had nothing left. When Ahaz abandoned the word of the Lord, there was nothing left but best guesses, conventional wisdom, and political scheming. There was nothing for sure, that's for sure, and the same is true for us today. If we go beyond the word of God, where do we go? If we refuse to build our lives on the divine revelation, what do we build upon? I hear people say all the time that they just trust their heart. I'm just trusting my heart. I'm just following my heart. That's a really dangerous proposition. Jeremiah said the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. And who can understand it? And the wise man said there's a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. Other people say they rely on the Spirit. Well, you better be careful there too because the Scripture says that not every spirit comes from God. Furthermore, I can promise you this, that the Spirit of God will never lead you in a direction that is opposite the Word of God. To the teaching and to the testimony. This should be our motto. The Word of God should be our news source. It should be our decision maker. And it should be our spiritual guide. We must rely on God's word to determine God's will so that we will be enlightened to make decisions and to pursue directions that please God. Otherwise, we too will be in darkness. The survey says that we're all basically good. The word of God says we are not good. That there is none righteous, no, not one. That we are sinners who deserve the wrath of God and are unable to save ourselves from it. The survey says that God accepts the worship of all religions, but the Word of God says that there's only one way out of our predicament. That there's only one way to peace with God the Father, and that is through Jesus the Son. The survey says that we choose what to do with our lives and our bodies. That it's all a matter of personal opinion, not objective truth. But that's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that if we desire to see God, if we desire to live in His presence, that we must be holy. That we must live lives shaped by the teaching and the testimony that reveals God's character, nature, and expectation. And listen, the Word of God has been revealed to us in no uncertain terms. Not just in words written down and preserved and transmitted to us through the millennia, although we have that too, praise God, but we also have it in the Word that became flesh and dwelled among us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the God with us. The writer of Hebrews put it like this. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. 
But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, and through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Church, if we do not listen to him to know God's will, we will end up going off making decisions and pursuing directions that are exactly opposite God's will. What is this word of God to you? He wants to be your news source. He wants to be your decision maker. He wants to be your spiritual guide. He wants to be your king. He will be your sanctuary or your stumbling stone. It all depends on whether or not you're willing to listen to Him, to trust Him, and to obey Him. Won't you return to the teaching and to the testimony while we stand and sing? Father God, just for today, help me walk your narrow way. Help me stand when I might fall. Give me the strength to hear your call. Yeah.